Our first scripture reading for this morning comes from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. As I read this, listen for God speaking to you. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never be again put to shame. Then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And our second passage comes from the book of Acts. We are continuing the story of Pentecost. And so um, what's happened previous to this passage is that the spirit has filled the room and the, the spirit of God was um, given to the disciples Tongues of fire rested on top of their heads, and they found themselves speaking in other languages, and it attracted the attention of those around the building. Now hear these words from verse 12 through 21. Again, listen for God speaking to you. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, praised, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Family, this is the word of the Lord. In 1863, our nation was in the middle of the Civil War. And at this point in time, things were starting to look good for the North, but the morale was still very low among the soldiers, among the civilians, among everyone up in the North. And that's because the death toll was so high. So many soldiers were dying in battles that people in the north began to ask whether it was worth fighting this war, whether it was worth all of these soldiers dying, whether it was worth even trying to keep the nation together. And in the midst of all of these questions, President Abraham Lincoln got up in front of some soldiers one day and delivered a speech that began with these words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Does this sound familiar to you today? So this is the beginning of his address that has now become known as the Gettysburg Address. That Abraham Lincoln went to Gettysburg in November of 1863 to deliver these remarks to uh, memorialize those who had fallen in the Battle of Gettysburg earlier that year. But what historians now say is that this address that he gave was one of the moments that turned the tide of the war to, the fa to favor the North. And it wasn't a military victory by any means, but what it did was improve the morale of Americans who were in the North, and he did that by reminding them what they were fighting for. He reminded them why their brothers were dying in the war. 
It wasn't for a lost cause, but it was rather to pursue a nation that is unified and a nation where every single citizen has a right and an ability to be treated equally. It's amazing, though, because it's a very short speech. It's only 227 words, but those 227 words changed the course of American history. So one lesson we can learn from this is never underestimate the power of words that are delivered by a leader who is passionate about his cause. Well, today we just read from some words that were delivered by another leader who was also passionate about his cause. And those are the words of Peter as he delivered the very first sermon in the church's history. So today, I'm going to preach a sermon about a sermon. Now, what's amazing about this passage is that Peter gets up and he starts to speak to people about salvation. And today, we're going to talk about salvation as we continue our series on the Holy Spirit that has become known to us on Pentecost Sunday. So we began a couple weeks ago by seeing how God's Spirit arrives and how God's Spirit comes into our lives and transforms who we are immediately. And last week we saw how just as quickly as God enters into our lives, God equips us to go out and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to focus on what the good news of Jesus Christ is. And how through God's Spirit, all of us are given this amazing gift of salvation. And how salvation could be something better than what we have ever expected on our own. So when Peter gets out, he sees this crowd and they see all of this commotion. They see these men speaking in all these different languages and most of them are pretty amazed. Some were doubting though. Some doubted. They said, well, these people are just drunk. And Peter gets out and he says, no, they're not drunk. It's, it's nine in the morning. It's too early for that. But then he immediately goes into this sermon that reshapes the Israelites' idea of what salvation is. And he begins by using very familiar imagery in the book of Joel. And the Israelites who had heard this would immediately go back to the prophet Joel and what was written and the time of Joel and what was going on there. You see, God called the prophet Joel in a time when the Israelites were yearning for salvation. They were yearning for God to deliver them. At this point in time, the Israelites had just been allowed to come back to Israel after spending a couple generations in captivity and And by this time, Israel had started to pick up the pieces of their lives. They had rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. They had even rebuilt the temple to worship God. But it just wasn't the same as the old days. It wasn't the same because even though the Babylonians let the Israelites go back, they were still ruling over the Israelites. The Israelites still knew that there was a foreign power that was ruling over over them. So even though they were free to worship God, they weren't quite saved in the way that they thought they would be, in the way that they thought God was promising them salvation. So it's in these days that God sends the prophet Joel and says, listen, you will know salvation. I, your God, will save you. This is what I promise on that day that I pour out my spirit on all flesh. And what the Israelites took this to mean was that God would offer them political salvation. Salvation to the Israelites was going to be one that was going, that was going to be political. And they looked for that day that a leader would come and would defeat all of the enemies around Israel and that Israel would enjoy a time of of independence, that Israel would be powerful among the nations. And this idea of salvation, political salvation, is what the Israelites expected on that morning when Peter came out to preach the good news of Jesus 
Christ. And what Peter was telling the Israelites is, look, you have this idea of salvation that is just political, and what you're doing is you're selling yourselves short. Because what you just saw in the room there was salvation in the fact that God has just poured out His Spirit on all flesh. And that salvation is something that is not just offered to the Jews, but something that is offered to everyone. And what we see here is that Peter is reshaping the, the, the Jewish idea of salvation. That it's not something that's just political, but it is, it is God's sustained presence in the world and God's sustained presence in our lives. And Peter is encouraging them to let God's spirit into their hearts, to let God's presence change who they are, and that it didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter if they were Israelites. It didn't matter if they were Greek or Roman. It didn't matter what kind of lifestyle they had been living, but rather Peter saying, come and embrace this salvation, which is God's sustained presence in our world and in our lives. This is the salvation that God has promised us. Now today... Other than a small group of Christians, I don't think most of us think of salvation as a political vindication of our faith. But I do think we sometimes make the same mistake that the Israelites make, which is narrowing our idea of what salvation is. And that when we think about salvation and when we talk about salvation, it often points us directly to what happens after we die. And we think of salvation only as the eternal life that God has promised us. Life in heaven, right? Where we live forever. Now, don't get me wrong. This is an important part of our salvation. The promise that God's love conquers death and that God's love lasts forever. And those who seek the Lord and desire a relationship with the Lord can enjoy that relationship for all eternity. Yes, this is an important part of our idea of salvation. But it is not the only part of salvation. And if we frame our faith and if we live our lives only thinking about what's going to happen after we die, we end up missing out on what God is really offering us. And we sell ourselves short. It would be like going to the Louvre in Paris and only looking at the glass pyramids that are in the front. Yes, those are really beautiful pyramids, but we would be missing out if we didn't step foot inside the Louvre and see all of the beautiful paintings and, and pieces of art that's in there. But if we look at Acts... If we look at the story of Pentecost, we will see that salvation is not only what happens after we die, but salvation is given to us the moment that we choose to embrace God's presence in our lives. And that will give us new life. What we learn on Pentecost is that God has poured his spirit out on all of us. And it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we were born it doesn't matter what we have done or not done. It doesn't matter the way that we have lived our life. But what matters is this moment when we have this decision to embrace God's presence, God's sustained presence in our hearts and in our world around us. And when we do that, we will begin to see life with new eyes. You know, I have been blessed enough to have made it to Jerusalem and the Holy Land twice in my life, and they both came at different seasons for me. The first time happened my first year of college. I took a semester and I studied abroad, and I did a, actually a two-month mission trip in Egypt and Israel, and we ended in Jerusalem. And I was 19 at the time, and it was, it was beautiful. It was a very formative experience in my faith as I saw all of these locations that I read about in Sunday school and that I read about 
growing up. And it was, a, it was an amazing experience. But then I went again, six years later. In between the first time and the second time that I went, I had spent six years studying the Bible. I had spent six years studying theology and church history in college and then in seminary. And so when I went back, Jerusalem looked the same, more or less. But I was seeing it with new eyes because I had spent so many years studying it. All of a sudden, I saw these things come to life in a way that I didn't even understand that first time that I was able to go. Taking the time to study and to learn allowed me to see Jerusalem with new eyes. In the same way, all of us live our lives. And sometimes life is really easy. Sometimes we are in a season in our lives where we are enjoying the abundance of God's blessings. But there are other times when life is hard. All of us, I know all of us in this sanctuary, have moments in our lives where life is very challenging. And we see it every week when we have the prayer requests come up. I know there are those of us in this congregation who are just tired right now. Between all of our responsibilities at work, all of our responsibilities at home, it just leaves us tired. I know there are those of us who are struggling with strained relationships in our lives. Mother's Day can be a very happy day, but can it, also, it can also be a very challenging day as well if we have strained relationships with our mothers or strained relationships with our children. And as you see, there are those of us here who are struggling, who are mourning the loss of loved ones as the people we love have passed away. Some of us here are in seasons of life that are so stressful because of the enormity of the decisions that we have to make. Yeah, sometimes life is easy, but I think all of us have experienced moments and even prolonged seasons when life is really hard. And it's especially in those moments when life is hard that it's important that we understand the salvation that God gives us is not something that just happens when we die, but rather something that is offered to us right here, right now. And the salvation is God's sustained presence in our lives. And if we take time to listen, if we take time to seek the Lord, we will see that God is here right now speaking words of love to us, telling us that we are not alone. If we take the time to listen, we will hear God saying how much he loves us and that each and every one of us are valuable. Not because of the accomplishments we've achieved, but rather because of who we are and that we are God's children. If we take time to seek God's presence, we will see that God gives us words of comfort that surpass our understanding. God gives us words of hope when everything seems hopeless. God gives us words of life and guidance and meaning and direction. This is the salvation that we can benefit from, not only when we die, but right here, right now. This is what Peter is preaching to the Israelites, and I think he can preach it to us today. When God's Spirit came on Pentecost, God's Spirit brings salvation, and it's God's Spirit that saves us, not when we die, or not only when we die, but God saves us every single day. So next week is Pentecost Sunday. And it's going to be a celebration. We're going to celebrate this day when God fulfilled his promise to never leave us and never abandon us. 
And it's going to be a day that we can celebrate the many ways that God saves us. So until then, I'd like for all of us to reflect on God's presence in our lives. And if we are on the mountaintop right now, we can thank God and acknowledge God's presence in giving us his blessings. And if we are in the valley, we can go to the Lord and receive those words of life and hope. But wherever we are, may God meet us where we are and give us his love until the day that Christ comes again. To God be all glory and honor and praise. Amen.